This four-dimensional graph uses the complex duals, a combination of the complex numbers, where i squares to negative 1, and the duals, where epsilon squares to 0. When i and epsilon interact, we get some weird results. In my last video, I compared these two sets of numbers, and this was part of my very nice plan to start with a video on the duals, then move to the split complex numbers, and finally to the general case. But then I posted the dual video, and what if you combine complex and that dual there is numbers no way to square so that you root get a now now you 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 Okay, okay. okay. I hear you. We'll try combining the complex and dual numbers. We'll use a real dimension, an imaginary dimension, and a dual dimension. But this isn't enough. We need a fourth dimension for i times epsilon, the imagidual dimension. But wait, why? Why can't we just define i times epsilon to be within these three dimensions? Let's try it. We'll say i times epsilon is some dollar plus at i plus and epsilon, where these are all real variables. Then if we multiply by i, on the left we get negative epsilon. On the right we distribute, then replace i epsilon with dollar plus at i plus and epsilon, and distribute again. This is real, but the left has no real part, so it should equal zero. And this is imaginary, but the left has no imagination, so it's also zero. It's only the dual that has a non-zero coefficient, negative one. But and is real, so it can't square to negative one. This fails. I epsilon can't go in these three dimensions. So we'll use color for the imagidual dimension. Light red for negative, black inverse for zero, and greenish purple for positive. We can then connect the positive and negative imaginals with these other points to make an orthoplex, the 4D version of an octahedron. It looks like an octahedron, at least until we spin logo it. Logo time! Oh, sorry, it's logo time. Okay, where were we? Oh yeah, spinning the orthoplex. It still has the flavor of an octahedron, but now with a little extra spice from that fourth dimension. But I'm not here to just watch shapes spin. I want to do stuff to the shapes. So let's square all the points. Now it's curvy, but it's hard to see what's going on. So let's bring it back to the original position. Now the curves just go between 1, 0, and negative 1. This is because the real vertices square to 1, the imaginaries square to negative 1, and the duals and imaginals square to 0. For even more clarity, let's use just a square for the input, which we label on the left foot side of the screen. The input square is just real and imaginary, so it curves between 1 and negative 1. But if we rotate it to be dual, that curve now goes to 0. And if we rotate it to be imagidual, it still curves to 0. And you might be thinking, that doesn't curve, it's a straight line. But look, it changes color. It's curving in the fourth dimension. If we swap the graph's dimensions, we're able to see that curve spatially. And by doing this, we notice that swapping the graph's dimensions looks the same as rotating the input. The dual square with a dual axis is identical to the imagidual square with an imagidual axis. And this is because they're essentially the same. They both square to zero. The i is irrelevant. It can't square to negative 1 if it always has an epsilon chain to it that drags it down to 0. Going back to the graphs, here's the imaginary square again. What if we move it? As it slides along the dual axis, the real outputs also slide along the dual axis. And the imaginary outputs slide along the imagidual axis. They're changing color. Watch what happens when we swap those dimensions. What if we move the input in a circle? It's going through the duals and imagiduals, so the outputs slide and change color. Now let's take the dual square as an input. If we slide in the imaginary axis, the output spreads from just a line into a big kite. But if we move in the imagiduals, the kite is flat. That's not going to grab any wind. There's no imagination in the input, so we don't get any in the output. And that's enough of just squaring. Now let's cube the inputs we get a nice flower. And the flower stretches if we slide the input in the duals. The real outputs go one way, while the imaginary outputs go the other. But if we swap dimensions, those points are all fixed. 
it's just the curves that are sliding. If we take some complex number hash plus epsilon and then cube this, we end up with hash cubed plus 3 hash squared epsilon. So if hash is real, the square will be positive. It will move in the same direction as epsilon. And if it's imaginary, the square is negative. It will move in the opposite direction. But what if it's a mix, like 1 plus i over 2? This squares to an imaginary, i over 2. So it moves in a different dimension, and twice as slow. So when we view the imaginal dimension, it's just the curves that move. They're the points with a mix of real and imaginary. And what if we take a dual square as the input? Now the output flower has only two petals. But with some imaginary sliding, it turns into a huge kite. And if we add some imaginal slide, then... The kite's really blowing around! Wow, it's so windy! Here's the entire orthoplex cubed. The curves connect these five output points. It's quite a nice looking shape, and it's fun to watch the input spin 90 degrees, along various axes. But if we spin at a random angle, then it turns into a ball of spaghetti, which is actually appropriate given the state of the code behind it. With the fourth power, we get curves between just two points, since the non-dual vertices all tesseract to one and spinning this is just more of the same. It's time we move on to roots. They're the whole reason that I made this video. Last time we learned that not all duals have roots. Let's take some dual number with real coefficients and try to square root it. If we square both sides, then do some algebra, we end up with these real parts. It's a problem if dollar is negative. Hash is real, so it can't square to a negative number. But we can fix this by using complex coefficients, since they all have a square root. This gives us the imaginals. Here is the root of an orthoplex. It looks weird, stretching off into the distance. The real and imaginary part is nice, an umbrella. But rotating to dual, it shoots off to infinity, because the pure duals still have no square root. If dollar is zero, then hash must be zero. But then the other hash is also zero, so this only works if and is zero. If it's something else, we've got a contradiction. The pure duals cannot root. As the input approaches pure duals, the output extends to infinity. And it's fun to watch some 90 degree rotations on the input. We get a similar shape with the inverse function. This is an inverse orthoplex, a scalpothro. Doing some 90 degree rotations, we see the lines morph between each other. The real and imaginary part is just a bulging square, but if we rotate it to be dual, it shoots off to infinity. Pure duals can't be divided, and neither can pure imaginals. Let's bring back the whole scalpothro, then rotate in a random direction. It morphs into a giant tangle of lines infinite spaghetti. <sighs> but I do have to confess something. I've been keeping a secret. There's another way to make the imaginals. This is the scalp throw off from that system. It actually has a nice structure. Spaghetti. Structure. Spaghetti. Structure. What is this other system? So far, we've assumed things are commutative. The imaginal is equal to the dualinary but we could instead define the imaginal to be the negative of the duolinary. Here, they're anti-commutative. They prefer to work from home. This anti-commuting seems like a bad thing, but the results are much nicer than the commutative. Taking the unrotated scale here's a 90 degree rotation, and then anti-commutative. Here's another rotation, and again, the anti-commutative. Why are the antis less messy? If we input the imaginary square and slide it along the duals, then the anti-output slides along the duals all in the same direction. But if it's commutative, it goes in different directions, and it changes color. It's bleeding into the fourth dimension, which we can see by swapping those axes. Going back to anti, it's seemingly static. There is no imaginal movement which is appropriate since the input has no imaginal movement. 
Inverting a number is fairly simple when anti-commutative. The dual coefficient is just based on the input's dual coefficient. And the same with the imaginals. The two dimensions are independent. But the commutative case is much messier. This is why we got all that spaghetti. They're dependent on each other. This difference occurs because anti-commutativity makes canceling easier. As an example, let's square i plus epsilon. When commutative, the imaginals combine. But when anti, one of them turns negative and they cancel with each other, leaving us with a simpler result. Doing this visually, if we square an imaginary square, then move it in the dual dimension, the anti-output also only moves in the dual dimension. The imaginals are getting cancelled. But if it's commutative, then we do get that color change. It's moving in both dimensions because there's no cancellation. And we see something similar using the third power. Anti-commutativity is annoying to work with, but it often gives a better result. This is why the quaternions are generally more useful than the bi-complex numbers, a system where i and j commute. And speaking of these, it would be fun to see them graphed in this way, but that'll have to wait for a future video. Thanks to my supporters. I really appreciate all of you. I have some extra footage that didn't make the cut, which I'll be posting as a treat for the monthly members. And thanks to everybody for watching. I'll see you next time when we compare the complex with the split complex numbers, and maybe even look at their four-dimensional combination.